Today we'll be talking about paranormal things on the other side of consciousness. I believe that everybody heard about this, so it would be very difficult to find someone who never heard about paranormal things. But it's a lot of skepticism about paranormal things. People don't really know it exists or doesn't exist. Today I will present you certain facts. Feel free to disbelieve these facts. All opinions are valuable, so we'll be discussing here. How we see our world? Do we see really what we really see, what really the world is? Probably not. So we see certain reflection of the world in our mind. And I would like to start with Plato's scale allegory. I don't want to talk a lot about all of you know about Plato, but just a little summary of this allegory. Suppose we have prisoners chained up in the, in the cave, facing the dead wall of the cave. And at the entrance door of the cave, there is sunshine, fire, something going on, people walking, some all actions happening. But the only thing what people see, they see what shadows on the dead wall of the cave. And they try to restore or understand what's really happening in the real world. This is how we perceive the world. If you remember, uh, those of you who were present in our first meeting when we talked about geometry and multidimensional geometry, we had a discussion about multidimensional space. And the question was, how can we see the multidimensional space? Do we see more than three dimensions? And my argument was, we don't even see three dimensions. We see only two dimensions. Because our retina is two-dimensional. And the rest we make up. From our experience, we see the object from different angles, the same as these prisoners. And from our life experience, we start believing that there is a three dimensions. But if we clearly realize that we see only two dimensions, make up third dimension, so it would be easy for us to say, okay, maybe there are four dimensions or five dimensions. In the play that gave allegory, there is a certain extension of this allegory. The prisoners who are in the chair in the cave and see only the sh uh, shadows on the dead wall of the cave. They all did somehow learn, somehow believe that they can understand what's go really going on in the real world. But if the prisoner getting unchained and goes to the real world outside the cave, this prisoner gets confused completely. Though everything what we have experienced uh, watching on the dead wall of the cave, they believe that it's really our world. But now when we came to the real world, we get com completely confused. We don't know what is that. We cannot even recognize these things. And next step, now suppose the prisoner came back to the, chain, uh, to the cave. One prisoner went outside. The other prisoners stayed in the cave. When the prisoner came back and started sharing his experience, what he saw outside, that prisoner's who stayed in the cave, didn't understand it. They completely confused and say, okay, probably you are too stupid. This is what really happened in our world. When we see some things which we're not get used to, we're getting confused. Confused, sometimes we start even denying the things. What is our take <coughs> on this allegory? First of all, what we are learning in the world? We were learning, we have experienced in the world of shadows. We don't really know what's happening in reality. Is it everything we have experienced and learned is the real world? Or maybe real world outside? And we have to learn how to learn that world. And then I would like to make one extra step in Plato allegory. Plato didn't do this, it's uh, my addition to that. The prisoner in the cave was looking into the world, trying to understand this world by shadows on the wall. But when the prisoner walked outside the cave, he get first confused, but he believed that it's real world. But maybe it's another shadow. Maybe he just left one chamber of the cave and get to another chamber of the cave. Maybe what he saw is also shadow of another world. Could be. So the question is, where, where we are? 
what we really see in the world. So many questions arise. What we see in the real world, our, our mind, our experience with the world, <coughs> is it a reflection? Is it a ref reflection of real world? Or maybe it's a reflection of another shadow of another world? How about our imagination, our dreams? Sometimes in our dreams we see things which are not real. It's just a result of our mind, our sleeping mind, or I know what starts of our mind when we sleep. Or we may open the door to all out of the cave. Sometimes we may have things that probably never happen. In our dreams we may see some fantasies that never happen. It's a product of our mind or it's re the reality somehow came to our mind. When we try to understand things like this, the question is how much we are biased to that. You know when people say we believe in Newton's law, we believe it really exists, and we don't believe in such and such things. What is our judgment based on? Maybe we bias here or bias there. Before we start talking about different facts, I would like to ask everybody. If you believe in paranormal things, please get skeptical. Don't believe everything you see. First of all, it may be shadow on the wall. And secondly, who knows, maybe it's just a product of your imagination. On the opposite side of the coin, out as skeptics, please open your minds. Sometimes skeptics are so skeptical, they don't want even admit that something is happening. So I don't want we go to either extreme, super believers or super skeptics. Once again, if you're believers, get skeptical. And please ask uh, tough questions. If you are believers, get skeptical. If you are skeptical, open your minds. When we talk about paranormal things, so far I will go step by step with the different paranormal uh, facts. But let's uh, try our judgment in the proper boundary. In physics, in normal traditional physics, by traditional physics I understand everything, including quantum mechanics, relativity, everything that's known by uh, as of today. One of the major components of our judgment in uh, traditional physics is reproducibility of events. Not a single event, not a single phenomenon in physics, which is, was discovered, is not accepted by the scientific community until it's reproduced in many different labs. And Definitely in different labs, you would not expect absolutely the same outcome of experiments. They could be off a little bit, distributed, and we apply statistical approach to verify if it's we accept it or not. In modern physics, like quantum mechanics, modern astrophysics, definitely we also expect reproducibility, the same as in normal physics. And our Traditional judgment also stays in place. What is the problem in paranormal events? I presume that everybody heard about them. I'm not saying anything new today as of the fact of existing of that event. Everybody heard. And everybody heard skeptical opinion about that. What is skepticism is based upon? This is a very important question because in traditional physics, we are dealing with not life matter. And this non-life matter doesn't have mood, doesn't have personality, so we expect to have its reaction the same at all similar circumstances. In all paranormal events, a very major and important part of the experiment is human being. And human being has a psyche, has mood, and therefore reproducibility is not 100%. You may see fantastic results with the same person and the next day no results at all. And definitely for people who are not inside the problem, they will say, okay, what's, how, why, why should I believe in that if it's, I cannot even sometimes repeat the experiments? I may make one point about proofs in traditional physics and in paranormal. In traditional physics, by physics I mean the science about the world. In traditional physics, we expect something being reproducible and around the mean. 
mean value, right? We have distribution, normal, normal distribution, typically. And if something goes far beyond the mean value, we call it outlier. We say, okay, it's something wrong with the experiment. We just ignore it. But we believe that it exists. So let me give you some little allegory. Uh, what's average height of a person? Okay. Male, female have different average height. Okay, male. Okay, let's say 5.6. Well, I don't know. 5.6, right? And we measured people. Okay, it's fine. Okay, 5.5, 6.3. Okay. But what if you would see the person 20 feet tall? What you would say? In traditional science, we say, okay, it's outlier. May happen. Anything may happen, just outlier. Very low probability. You don't say there's something different, something new. You say just very low probability that such people exist. But such people don't exist. The, my point is that when we talk about paranormal, we better be focused not on the mean value of distribution, we focus on outliers. If some phenomena happens or occurs which cannot fit in any theory, open your eyes and see what may cause it. All of us heard about hypnosis. When we talk about paranormal things, most people say, okay, it doesn't exist. Okay, why? Uh, for many reasons. But when people say about talk about hypnosis, Everybody believes, yes, it's established fact. Doctors using hypnosis. Tell me, who knows how hypnosis works? Hypnosis is a pretty complex thing. But it's accepted because it's, we get used to that. What I also want us to keep up with today is Occam's razor. Whatever facts are, Occam's razor said, don't try to apply more complex explanation if simply explanation works. Or, I can rephrase it, out of all explanations, the simplest should be selected. In other words, like I say, don't speculate too much beyond the reasonable re uh, boundaries. So let's try to keep up today with that. I would like to introduce one of the very important concepts in paranormal things, this biological field or called biofield. The whole idea, why I put it first before even presenting your facts, just keep this in mind when we'll be talking about facts. Maybe it will help us to understand better, better each other. If we come back to quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, if I have an electron, free electron, without any interaction, it exists anywhere. It exists anywhere at the same time. It's like a smog. Electron is certain borders. It's already distributed. It would put together many particles together their distribution gets narrower and narrower. Big micro objects like chair, human body, walls, it's also a collection of small particles. And their so-called wave package, it's a term from quantum mechanics, gets very narrow, though the wings exist. Therefore, if I take any solid body, any object in the universe, it still has quantum mechanic nature. It has its border, what is most compressed part of this package, and the wings exist. The exponentially going down, but they exist. So the fact of existing the field beyond the object, it's known in quantum mechanics. In uh, paranormal events, the con con concept of biofield says that our body also exists in certain field. We have, we're generating certain field. I would probably would not say we're generating, we exist in that field. And we can interact with the body by interacting with that field. Now I will start presenting one by one several facts. Uh, some facts I was eyewitness myself. Uh, for your information, I've been involved in such research for many years. Uh, some facts which I was not involved, I'll tell you. I just took it, I don't know, i never seen it live. But some, some uh, facts I say, I saw it live. If you have a trained person who can generate and control the biofield, the person can take this, let's say, two fingers, and you will see discharge between fingers. Definitely it's not 110 volts. It's not as lightning, but some light discharge. It sounds very interesting. What is that discharge? So let's try to explain this. 
human body is a very complex body. We have a lot of electrical phenomena in our body, our nervous system based on electricity, and we may generate some discharge here. I don't need to go beyond anything. But another fact is, and I saw that fact, if a trained person uh, makes this discharge and you put high-speed film between these fingers, the high-speed film, high film would see the track. Film would be exposed. It's also could, nothing super here to just look for supernatural. It's okay, discharge, film reacts on that. The interesting thing happening after that, we take this film and gave it to other person who also trained. And this person, look at this track, can tell you about that person who put the track. This is interesting. How is information stored there? First of all, how information got there? If it's just simple uh, electrical discharge of our plus minus charges in our body, so how they store information? It's, it's not simple information, it's very complex information. The trained person can even tell what the person is, what's the problem with the person is, a lot of information about person. So somehow this field carries the information. I was eyewitness of that many times. Everybody heard about aura. What do you think? Does aura exist? No. Have you seen it? No. But even from a traditional physical standpoint, physics standpoint of physics, why not? If our body generates electricity, we have a lot of impulses, it should be some charge out of I, I see nothing wrong with that. But the interesting thing is, from the traditional standpoint, we don't need to go beyond Occam's razor to say, okay, we can explain it as just elect electrical discharge of our body. But interesting things come from trained people. Trained people can read this aura and give you information about the person. I remember when I uh, was presented, some, or someone was showing me the aura. I was great, the same skeptical as you. Said, nah. Okay, they showed me what to do. I saw it. So okay, okay, it's illusion. It could be optical illusion. If you look at the bright light or something, you, you may see some, something like aura. So it's probably illusion, my eyes illusion. And this person starts changing aura. Wow, it's no longer illusion. Right? By the way, I'm not insisting you believe everything that I said. No, I said differently. I expect you believe what I said. I don't expect you believe that it's right. Maybe I'm mistaken. So, one hand, be skeptical. On other hand, try to op open your eyes. People can see when they blindfolded. Have you heard about this? There was a... A lot of experiments done back uh, in the second part of the 20th century in Russia about telepathy, telekinesis. And it was a person uh, named Rosa Kolishova. She could see being blindfolded. Even You see the wall? She stick her uh, arm across the wall. And she was asked to recognize different colors, different objects. And she did great. Statistically great. It was not as in the physical experiment with the uh, typical physical objects, but it was statistically good. Question, how it's possible? She could recognize the objects. I can tell you that I was eyewitness. Even more sophisticated experiments. A desk, a person is blindfolded, and different objects put on a desk. Person just put his hand about like this, maybe foot, less, less than foot, half foot, and scan the, the desk, finds objects, tells not only color, what object it is. It's a watches, or it's a watch, or the bill, whatever. And if it's some, let's say, object that has owner, like watch, this watch may give information about owner. These facts I watched myself many times. This fact, I didn't see myself. The previous, I saw myself, so I would like to separate. I saw this on TV, by the way, on History Channel. A guy, Alex Levit, being blindfolded, he could see objects. 
I wouldn't even mention it today if I wouldn't be sure that it may exist. I don't know this person in person. I never seen his experiments just only on TV, but it may happen. He could see objects being blindfolded. He could play pool and pretty high quality. The only problem is he was legally blind. So you, you may say he may be having some holes in this blindfold, but he was legally blind, medically blind. He never seen. At least it gives us some thoughts what may happen. It's not simple electromagnetic fields. It's not simple infrared. Something uh, makes him focus. Let's talk about blind vision. How would you explain this? So the, once again, the first part of experience when people would, could recognize and find objects being blindfolded, I saw it myself, so I may be tricked, which I doubt, uh, for many reasons, I can say why. Uh, about this other part, guy, Alex Levitt, I saw him on TV, but it didn't contradict what my previous experience is, so I'm pretty much sure that he did it. So how could we explain this? You may try it to explain with the traditional physical concepts. Infrared, guys, how could he better than military night vision devices? He's so much better. How come? What, what the physics behind that? You know, my, my purpose of learning this stuff is not uh, that well, I want to become a magician or I would like to show some magic. I'm a physicist. I would like to understand, does it exist? Is it really true? If it's true, what stays behind that? What physical laws and what laws of nature stayed behind that, how it works. It's very difficult to explain, by the way. But even if you try to explain the traditional electromagnetic sensitivity or some other things, how would you explain his precision? His, he was very precise. Playing pool, you have to be very precise. How could you explain the, the first part of blind vision when people can identify objects and provide information about owners of that object? How could you do it? Telepathy. The uh, term telepathy came from Greek, is distance vision. And a lot of experiments was done, were done in this area. I, I saw myself some experiments. In this case, I cannot claim that my personal experience makes me believe that these facts are established. As I said, whatever I saw myself, whatever I can claim that it's exist, I can say, but in this case, I saw many things, but I didn't get this 100% uh, assurance of that exist. But a lot of experiments were, uh, were conducted in Russia, in America, by the way, too. Uh, some experiments sounded very, very, very realistically. I read about 15 years ago, to even 20 years ago, uh, it was an experiment done here uh, in the United States when people on big distance, one person was looking at the object, another person was drawing the object. I don't know how accurately these experiments were performed from the statistical analysis. I can only say that people claim that it exists. Diagnostics and healing. This is a very interesting part. You probably heard about healers. They call them the energy healers. They can diagnose the person without touching the person. And they can heal the people. Do you believe in that or not? How it works? We have a lot of evidences of that. And probably all of you heard about such evidence. Question, how it works? I heard many people say, okay, you say I'm treating you. And people believe this. And because people believe that, he heals. First of all, sometimes people don't believe it. But the question is, how it works? Because it's very difficult to convince other people that it works. Many people will say, okay, it's all just, just a tricks. And by the way, you Reiki masters, do you perform the same way every day? Or sometimes it goes better, sometimes it goes worse? Depends on your mood, attitude. It depends. So you cannot get reproducibility. You may have in your life some experiences that go beyond any reasons. Something happened that medicine gave up. My interest in that was to understand it exists or doesn't exist. Sir. I got engaged in that research many, many years ago. It was back in Moscow, Russia. 
I am a theoretical physicist at that time, working in the Academy of Sciences. And a friend of mine, he already passed away, but he was one of the greatest psychiatrists. And we heard about a laboratory in Moscow which is engaged in that research. And we went to that lab with my friend. I'm sorry, purpose was not positive. I came to that lab to tell them that, guys, before telling this stuff to people, take textbooks on physics, read it, and don't tell me that it may happen. And a friend of mine came to that lab with the only one, also purpose, to give them diagnosis. Okay, guys, you better be my patients, I will treat you. We came to that lab. I don't know how, but we decided not to tell them what we wanted to tell. <laughs> they showed them something, we said, okay, interesting, maybe. Uh, and we start learning that. You know, interesting, in six months, he didn't have such idea to tell them that they're crazy. And I didn't want to give them a uh, textbook on physics. Something, when you learn something yourself, you see it works. Uh, you know, interesting thing, for many years, I'm talking about the things to different people, to my colleagues, and many people want to say, uh, they're just saying, prove it to me, show me, prove it to me, and they mean traditional scientific proof. And I always keep saying to them, okay guys, if you're really curious, spend six months of your life, learn it. After that, you'll start seeing what's true, what's not true. But some of my friends still, already about all, almost 40 years, keep discussing with me, okay, prove me, and they don't want to learn it. I can tell you in advance that whatever you will see with your own eyes, you will still have some ideas, maybe some virus there, maybe some tricks there, maybe some, someone is pulling your legs. If you're really curious, you would like to learn it, learn it. It doesn't take too much. But as soon as you start understanding it's not tricks, you will change your mind and will not deny what you see. Okay, let's try to understand this, how it may work and what could be the explanation. Suppose I start treating a person. A person came to me and said, okay, I have a headache. I give him love, person gets relaxed and headache is gone. Okay, nothing magic, just simple love. There is no physical mechanism here, just I told per person, I gave person love and the person healed himself. It's okay. We don't need to uh, go beyond Occam's razor and try to made up, make up any new physical events or any physical laws. But now things happen. You can do it on a big distance. You can treat things which are not simple as headache. By the way, I never said that headache is really simple. There were many serious causes of headache. It's just an example. I've seen people treated from diseases that medicine just gave up. Just gave up. I'm not practicing treatment myself now. But when I was learning that, I remember it was an interesting time in my life. I work at the Academy of Sciences, a theoretical physicist. And when I learned this, definitely nothing would be more interesting than this. One year I just dropped all my scientific work <laughs> and started treating people. Oh, not always was success, but some successes were so stunning, like it's outliers. It couldn't be, it couldn't be. It makes you believe that maybe something beyond that. And it could be done on any distance. It doesn't matter where the physical person is. Here, there. One argument, very interesting argument about just convincing person that he is okay and the person gets better. You can treat people without seeing person on distance. Right. Definitely you have to be ethical, don't even touch person if he doesn't want it. Suppose person wants it. Person can leave you any identification of that person. Watch, sock, tie, whatever he wears, or better, photo. And you can start treating person by picture and person sits in, uh, it's just resides in New York. And the person doesn't know exact time when you treat him. So it's not just convincing person. And all of a sudden you call the person say how you feel. So you know, I don't know, something happened, I, I'm now okay. How would you explain this? I would I say that if I tell you, now I'm gonna treat you, psychologically happen. But if I didn't tell you that, I, I got your agreement, you agree that I will treat you. But you don't know the time. You're somewhere far, far away. And all of a sudden you get well. I call so how you feel? 
You know, something happened. I'm well now. I'm good. Say, so, you know, I just treated you. Is there any simple explanation to that? The concept of uh, treatment that we have, our body exists in the biofield. It's an extension of the field. What's the nature of this field? Nobody knows yet. And the point is, if your field is in a good condition, your organs would be in good condition. If the field is damaged, your organs would get damaged, whatever they are, good or bad. Treatment is not treatment the organs. It treatment the field. You're fixing the field, you make fi field nice, and the organs have no way to improve. They're only improving. Diseases go away, everything. You just feel, uh, treat the field. Is it true or not? Maybe it's just, it's just rumors, urban legend. Or the facts exist or not? Uh, if they exist, really, how they may work? This is extraordinary evidence. After I received these pictures. These pictures I received two days ago from the healer. Unfortunately, diabetes is not a very good disease. That healer sent me an email. A person got gangrene on his foot. It's a real patient. It happened now. Gangrene spread to the bone. They took a part of the bone and wound didn't heal. Doctor said we have to amputate the foot. But that person himself made the decision, I want to fight. In a couple of weeks, all of a sudden, the wound starts shrinking. And the last week, picture, it closed. It was done. So right now, wound closed, pain gone. Patient can walk and left for business trip. He's fine. Question, how it works? You cannot convince just person that gangrene would go away. Otherwise, uh, they had no problems with such disease. And physical mechanism behind, beyond that is still unknown. For many years, I had different discussions about that. One of a friend of mine, he said to me, okay, people who are healing, other people, like you guys, very dangerous people. I say, why? Because you can heal. I say, why do you think so? I say, because you have physical capability of healing and you can go other way. My answer was very simple. When you go for surgery and you're lying down on the table under complete anesthesia, surgeon can cut your heart off and throw it away. Physically, it has all capabilities, right? Have you heard about such things? No, it's not happening. Why you should say that the people who heal people should kill them or damage them? But a very interesting question. Yes, technically it's possible. If you can fix the biofield, you can damage the biofield. Therefore, it's very important that when you learn it, you have first be ready for that in your moral level in your ethical level. We don't have such energy power here. So something is different. Some different mechanism works here. Some different physical principles here. And we still don't know that, what, what the principles are. The patient not required to believe in that. Yes, if person, uh, if patient believes in that, it goes much easier. And it's, uh, but if person doesn't believe it, still we can do it. But definitely it's uh, more difficult to do it if people don't believe it. Telekinesis. People can move objects with their minds. Oh, it's a lot of rumors about that, a lot of uh, urban myths. And people always looking for some hidden threads or magnets or something else. One thing that makes it uh, hard to believe, because for every person who can do it, by the way, this person, even person who can do it, he can do it today well, tomorrow in a bad mood, he cannot do it. Every person who can do it, there are dozens of people who sincerely believe they can do it, and they don't do it. And therefore, common public, it's definitely a disappointment. Okay, it's a sort of trick. I would like to tell you about one person, Nina Kulagina. She was investigated at Russian Academy of Sciences. Top physicists did it. So they set up experiments in their labs. Everything was absolutely clean, so they made sure that nothing was hidden there. I would like to show you footage. We may deny it. We may say it, it never happened, it, uh, all these tricks. But it was done 
and laboratory conditions, very respectable physicists were investigating her, and they found it. They admitted it happened. Have you heard about Wolf Messing? It was a person. He was born in the uh, early 19th, uh, 20th century. Uh, he was born, and now it's Poland. That time it was the Russian Empire. And he, f he had a gift. He could see into the future. He could read people's mind. He went to Germany. He was doing as a show. He wanted to do research in that, but never happened. He was investigated by Albert Einstein and Sigmund Freud. They were very impressed with his, with his capabilities. And in one show in Germany, it was 1933, Rise of Reich, uh, some Nazi office, uh, of officers, officials asked him what will happen to the, our Reich. Everybody expected the answer. And he said it's going to fall in 12 years. So Hitler gave 200,000 Reichsmark for his head. He fled. He fled to Soviet Union. Definitely he was captured on the border as a spy. But after he did a couple of things, he ended up in the office of Stalin. He was the person who had direct phone number from Stalin. He could call him directly. I can show you some footage. It's not a real documentary, it's just a movie about him, but uh, it's, what it shows is true. When he came to the Soviet Union, he ended up in Stalin's office. Oh, what's the what's heck? What's what the people say you can do things? Okay, let's do it. Uh, Stalin gave him a challenge. You have to leave my office, but I call my guards not to let you out. You have to go to the bank and bring me. And, and Stalin gave him a blank piece of paper. Show them a piece of paper, this blank piece of paper, and bring me 100,000 rubles. And come back to my office and I ask my guards not to let you in. Could you see, could you imagine how hard the challenge is? When Messing came back with 100,000 rubles in his pocket and showed the Stalin, Stalin said, how come? How did you leave? How did you get back? And he started interrogating his guards. Say, has someone walked in and out? Say, no. Only Beria was in and out. He told, <laughs> he just put impression on the guards that he's Beria, and he, submitted a blank piece of paper in the bank, and they gave him 100,000 rubles. Uh, he died in 1974. I was blessed I met him when he was alive, and I was participating in his experiments. And he was never given any laboratory, any conditions to learn it. Information channeling. It's another very interesting thing. We may perform as receptors of information. Sometimes in, your, in our dreams we see something fantastic and we don't know what the dream is, what, what the dad. I personally met a couple of people who can do fantastic things. I'll start with Moscow. In Moscow we had one person whose speech was not very soft. He was speaking very roughly. He was not trained to speak nicely. But when he got in this certain condition, all of a sudden he started composing poetry, beautiful poetry in such a high speed that his wife was just barely writing it down. When the session is over, he come back to the normal state and who couldn't say a smooth word? What is that? How can you explain this? You can explain this simple way, okay? All of us have hidden capabilities. Uh, I was always very curious about hypnosis. And when, even since I was a student, I was always signing up for experiments for hypnosis. So the, the, at the university, I was never taken to this as, as a guinea pig for this uh, hypnosis uh, because I was very bad in that. <laughs> but once I was in the presentation about hypnosis, one hypnotizer from Russia, he was not treating, he was uh, promoting capabilities of people under hypnosis. He took a group of students who couldn't paint anything, were not very good artists very bad artists. He selected speci specifically, hypnotized them and said, you are Leonardo da Vinci. And the students start drawing something. First, 
Uh, then in a couple of seances, they were pretty good drawings. And he said, okay, under hypnosis, you can emphasize what you have inside. You relieve all your uh, stresses, all your breaks, and it's normal. It's, uh, it's not, nothing extraordinary here. Uh, I came back home from that presentation, get to my desk and say, Sergey, why do you need any hypnosis for that? And I said to myself, okay, Sergey, you are a fantastic painter, artist. I take, took pencil, piece of paper, and draw something very nice. It's still hanging somewhere with my friends in Moscow. We can't do that, right? So our psyche is ready for that. But when people start composing poetry or music, it's interesting. This is another look at this. They are getting a channel, right? And information starts coming to them from somewhere. How we can be judged? What is self-imposed and what is coming? I can tell you quite recent events, some recent information. We had a person, we have a person right now, who claims that he got in contact, he gets in contact with the outside world, and he writes. Information comes and he writes. And this is one of the samples of his writing. It's written right to left. His normal writing, left to right. It's 440, ends up 710. Very short period of time. Can you write in your own language so accurately, so in such a high speed? It's impossible. He's writing like it's his own language. He understands nothing. He doesn't know what he's writing. He says, something happening to me, and I start writing. I start writing, drawing, and he doesn't know what is that. But it's, everything is very accurate. If you're just making it up, your script wouldn't be so nice. It's a known language, and we are in possession of hundreds of pages. Not one. Hundreds of pages. Very consistent. When I first look at this, I say, okay, what is that? I am a researcher. I am not a believer, extreme believer. I am not extreme skeptic. I am a believer who is skeptical. I am a skeptic who keeps eyes open. First explanation came to my mind, I can share with you. This guy is mentally sick. Reasonable. He's mentally sick, he developed his own script, and he's sincerely pretending that he is writing something. I called my friend, psychiatrist, asked him, showed him, said, tell me, what is that? He said, I don't know. He said, I said, okay, suppose, just give me a very simple answer. Suppose you have a person who came to your office, and showed you the scripts, and you look at the scripts, what would be your intention? To just put the scripts in the garbage and start treating him, or maybe look at the scripts seriously? He looked at me and said, you know, from my experience, I will take it seriously. Then, we found connection in NASA. We sent it to a person in NASA who knows many ancient languages, all, all these strange scripts, any, all, all of them, and he his response was, I don't know what is that, but it sounds serious. I can give you no more information. I have no idea what is that. We're still trying to crack it. But if you remember Enigma machine, Germans in the World War II, it was not easy to crack. So we found ourselves in a similar situation. We tried to find, to find primer, and we're coming to that primer. But still a long way to go, but I hope we'll do something. But at least we have hundreds of such pages. Another very strange thing, pyramids. Everybody aware of pyramids, and pyramids have very interesting features. If you place objects in the focus of pyramids, and pyramids could be of different shapes, and they, they work like lenses, and they can impact on live objects, and they can also impact on normal objects, which, is not, which are not live objects. What's the energy? What's the focusing here? How they focus the energy and how they perform this? It's unknown. Now we're coming to the almost final stage. Ghosts. Have you heard about ghosts? How about many people see the same thing at the same time? What is that? Hypnosis? Who did it? So, what are the key points of all things we discussed today? We can see in our world many things. To the statement that skeptics open your eyes and believers get skeptical. Yes, we shouldn't close our eyes, turn our blind eye to things which exist, but we should not believe without the proof. The only question is, what is the proof? 
Should we follow the traditional scientific methodology with a bell-shaped curve, where they only want to send something in the middle, or we should talk about outliers, something, things that don't get in any framework of explanation? Please don't deny what you see. If it exists, it deserves to be learned. If it exists, if it happens, we have to learn it. We have to understand how, how it works. Keep your mind open all the time. And always remember that our world is much more complex than we can even imagine. Never say that whatever we have now, whatever we know about our world now, is the end of the story. Nothing else will happen. If you go back to the ancient Greeks or Romans, and start telling them about electromagnetic field, uh, you know their reaction. Don't be like them now. Things may exist, but we have to be sure that it's really not rumors, it's not really our imagination, it, we really have proof of existing on their things. And try to think out of the box. Again, just a uh, reference to ancient Greeks and Romans, you come to them, suppose you have a time machine, you come to ancient uh, time, and start telling ancient Greeks and Romans about electromagnetic fields. Whatever you tell them stories, they wouldn't believe you. You show them something, okay, you see that push the button here, signal comes up here, you say, okay, where's the thread you pull? The only thing is, how can you convince them? Say, guys, let's learn and do it ourselves. Then when they do it themselves, then they will start believing it. If you want to understand whether it exists or not, definitely you have to listen to other people, but my recommendation, learn it yourself. It doesn't take much time. You don't need to become professional in all the things. Learn and understand at least one little thing, which relieves you from the looking for the tricks, and you start thinking, okay, it's really, I can do it myself, it exists. The question is, why we haven't learned it yet? This presentation is prepared by Institute of New Physics. It's an informal institution. It's, uh, there is no such building, there is no such ent business entity. It's what we do, try to learn this stuff. We invite everybody who has desire to learn this, who has any capabilities. Even if you don't have capability, you would, would like to learn it, you would like to participate in something, uh, we're open. And the question is, why? If it's so evident, you said it's uh, wolf messing, beginning of the 20th century, even in the past, why mankind still denying that? I gave a lot of thoughts about that. Why? And I can't tell you. If you will tell other people that heal by energy 200 years ago, the best, the best outcome would be you stay alive. Okay, 200 years in the past story. Now we still tolerate you guys. You're here, you're still alive. In the beginning of the 20th century, when Wolf Messing came, and he was not alone, many other people, People that time were not as evil, they didn't kill that people, but what happened? Why Einstein and Freud investigated Wolf Messing and could say nothing? They had no idea what is that. Einstein and Freud did to Messing. The fact that they investigate him is proven, but uh, there is no written results of their investigation. But allegorically, I can say, from the status of science at that time, what they could do, probably stick a bulb, light bulb in their ear and see it lights up. They didn't have any idea what's going on. They tried to find out uh, the solution in existing principles of physics. It failed. Therefore, Wolf Messing and other people like him ended up giving freak shows. Wolf Messing was giving freak shows. He was coming to the audience in the little towns and say, guys, let me predict your future. He was not given the chance because people don't even know what to do with him. Okay, the second part of the 20th century, it was huge research. It started mostly in Russia, then it was done in America too, about paranormal things, telepathy, telekinesis, parapsychology, treatment, and, in, and this research ended up in complete disaster. You know, the whole skepticism we have now in the scientific world is due to that research in the second part of the 20th century. You ask any credible scientist now, and people wouldn't even talk to you about that. They say, we don't even want to talk. Just like uh, they have inquisitory opinion that, would, that it doesn't exist, that's it. Why? 
What happened in the uh, uh, second part of the 20th century? People did a lot of research. The problem was people who could perform, they had no idea about sciences. They couldn't explain. They couldn't even try to explain. They said, I do it, it happened, but I don't know how. People who investigated them, they didn't bother to learn how to do it. And they applied traditional physical uh, principles to that. In the result, researchers couldn't even identify who is fraud, who is sincerely fraud, who is just real operators. Academician offer run this research, very serious academician, world-renowned academician, physicist. They did everything to make sure that there is no threats, no fraud, everything is moving. And they didn't know what is that. They set up a, a lot of sensors, and finally they registered ultrasound. And their conclusion was, uh, Kalagina generates ultrasound, and ultrasound moves objects. It's exactly what happened in the second part of the 20th century. It was a wrong methodology, and they, they, uh, they couldn't go beyond the box, and therefore resulted in complete skepticism. Not a single serious university now is going to be engaged in that. It's like a religion among all traditional scientists. We don't even want to talk about that. Whatever facts we have, it's all tricks. All tricks, nothing else. I would say that now time has come uh, to fix that errors and mistakes. Facts exist. First of all, we have to learn how to distinguish and separate real facts from tricks. We can set up serious experiments to do that. And we have to learn what is driving that, what physical principles, probably new principles. If you remember the 100 years ago, when relativity came to this world, when quantum mechanics came to this world, nobody believed that. You know, the, the, one of the major discoveries in physics of 20th century was relativity by Einstein. He was never given Nobel Prize for relativity. Why? People didn't believe it. They were afraid. What if they're wrong? That time, now we say, okay, relativity, quantum mechanics, everything exists. That time, people didn't know. And until it happened, that experimental proof of relativity, you know the experiment with the star, gra gravitation lens. People didn't believe it. Quantum mechanic. People didn't believe in quantum mechanics. Do you know what Einstein wrote about quantum mechanics? Einstein wrote, I don't believe that God rolled dice. In quantum mechanics, everything uncertain. He said, I don't believe that God rolls dice. In positron, in 30s, when antimatter was discovered by Dirac, people didn't believe it until it opened. So our goal is to investigate it. And uh, the purpose of today's talk was to just inspire people and give them some perspective. I don't insist on any of your opinions. I don't insist that it exists. I don't insist it doesn't exist. My goal was to bring you up to the, your attention, and you decide, and you make your own conclusion. Thank you very much.